Welcome to another edition of the Influence Global podcast. And I'm really delighted to have a, a really special guest with me today, which is Becky Flint. And Becky is the co-founder of um, a boutique agency in London called Pepper Studio. And I've followed Becky for a while to see her sort of meteoric rise um, from from content creator uh, through to uh, you know running her own agency with t- her two other founders. So welcome, Becky. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. And we're going to talk a little bit about what it's been like to have that sort of digital mindset from a content creator. And you, you were saying to me earlier bef- before we were recording that you're not, you don't see yourself as a brand marketeer in the traditional sense. But I think having this sort of digital digital uh, creative mindset has, has helped you enormously in the way in which you work with your clients so let's let's roll back a little bit and and start from when did you decide to become a content creator so I mean this is the thing I've I've had the internet in my life all my life you know I was born in 1995 the year of the world wide web and my family were always so keen to have you know computer in the home and access to the internet because they could really see that this was going to be something majorly huge for our society and so I've always grown up around computers and um you know that's that kind of element of you know I love love seeing what I was seeing on the computers um I'm from the Isle of Man it's quite a small community and so it really allowed me when I was younger to broaden my horizons and I felt so incensed not only to consume um what I was seeing online but also I wanted to contribute to these amazing communities out there and create as well so whether I started out when I was like super young making little websites and you know having fun with my friends to then eventually starting a, a YouTube channel um and kind of going from there really I've just always felt like if I'm somebody who's consuming this then I also want to be creating it and you know because otherwise if we all just consume there'd be nothing to consume no one would be making anything so it felt it felt only fair <laughs> uh, of course it makes absolute sense so where where was your niche where's your passion in terms of the type of content so I mean when I began I was like well I mean I've been doing it for a long time but when my videos kind of took off um I was about 13 years old and um a big fan of like Japanese pop culture and um my videos went viral in Japan um which were all about kind of uh, Japanese pop music and um because that was just reflecting my interests um you know back onto the internet and then the interest kind of got reflected back onto me in a sense so um that's what I started off doing but I mean that was such a long time ago now that my interests have completely changed so um as I've grown older you know I I uh, really took an interest in fashion I did content about like alternative fashion um you know I started my own fashion brand when I was younger as well and then um after After that, I mean, more nowadays, so I've started my business now and I've been, ever since I've been working, my content creating has took a little bit of a backseat because there's only so many hours in the day. Um, But now I tend to create content more around um, art and history and fashion. And they're my interests that, you know, I've I've had for a couple of years now. So um, yeah, it's just, you know, ebbs and flows. I think if you've been around on the internet for such a long time, it's always going to change, isn't it? Yeah. And when did you decide to... um... Because I think you worked for a tech startup, did you? Am I right? Or... I did, yeah. So um, I start. well, this is the thing. So I started my career in influencer marketing. Um, pr- previously, you know, I was just an influencer myself. I was receiving brand deals from different companies. And I was always thinking in my mind, um, who is sending me these emails? Like, what is this? How is this? How has this campaign come to be? Um, I, how did they choose me? Why did they choose me? what's this creative idea that they're coming up with? Like, do I have to do this? Can I think of my own idea? Um, I just always had that question in the back of my mind because it was so interesting. I mean, when I started, there wasn't even monetization on YouTube. There wasn't the Google partner program. And now it's become such a huge, you know, economy around creators and influencers. So um, I was, I had that question in my mind and I was wondering what I should do next. I didn't necessarily want to kind of be a content creator for the rest of my life. So I thought I'll move to London and I'll, um, join this influencer tech startup agency. It was a platform. Um, and I, I was just so shocked at how much there was for me to learn about the marketing industry, but also vice versa, how much there was for the influencer, the em- emerging influencer industry. This was in about 2016 to learn from the influencers themselves. There was so many things that I thought were common sense that were just being completely missed. Mm-hmm. And that's a really good point. For example, I often 
concern myself with the way in which some um, creators are um, engaged with in terms of email. It, 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 so often you see blanket emails just going to everybody and you think, have you not thought about, you know, we, we've got highly engaged audiences. Have you not thought about sending something a lot more personal and that you've taken the time to look at our content to make sure that it, it sits with your vans, uh, with your, with your um, values rather? Um, it just amazes me that still this goes on. So you're absolutely right. I think content creators can share a lot of feedback and and support for for agencies, brands, and platforms. So um, you you joined this this uh, startup. Um, and then I think that didn't work out, did it? The, 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 no, no it, 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 so it was quite, I mean, it was quite a turbulent, traumatic time, to be honest. With working at the tech startup for a while, there was always a couple of different platforms around in the industry. The one that I was working at ultimately failed. It went under um, really terrible, you know, at the end, very terrible relationships with the indus- influencer industry. They're trying to like build this technology. It's very expensive. Didn't have the money to fund it. And it ultimately just kind of collapsed one miserable afternoon. My Myself and about you know 20 of us all just lost our jobs on the same day so we were all sitting around like oh my god what are we going to do now um and I've been working with these these colleagues of mine for years by this point and the work that we were doing in terms of the campaign side of things it was good work it was working it was profitable so we kind of just couldn't really understand how the platform side could just ended up tanking everything so myself and two of those colleagues Joe Friend and Alice Jones we were all kind of you know scrambling like applying for jobs and we had this in the back of our mind where we're thinking the work that we were doing was really good the relationships that we have with our clients was really good like we loved the influencers we were working with let's see if perhaps you know with this I think when you get made redundant you get like a little bit of holiday back pay from the government for the time off that you didn't get to take ultimately Um, And we were like, okay, we've got a small buffer. Let's come together and start an agency ourselves. And I don't think any of us thought that we would still be doing it like three months down the line. Um, And here we are three years later entering into our kind of, you know, fourth birthday next March. So um, yeah, it was a bit of a crazy ride. And I think as more and more time has passed, I feel more and more, um, you know, proud of what we've achieved with Pepper but it did come from this this quite a crazy time period where we literally just had to take a bit of a leap of faith yeah and it's and it's one of the things that I picked up in the early days of of me getting involved in the sector is it it was a bit like a wild west and still is to a degree and I think um you know people become accidental influencers haven't they and 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 uh, you know a lot of people that have come into the space haven't really been able to navigate it in the right in the right way uh plus of course when there's a lot of money swishing around it attracts all sorts of all sorts of people should i say um and and what you want to be trying to do is to make sure that you you stand out from the best um, and I know that you've won some uh, a number of awards, which is amazing. Well done, you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, um, and uh, I think it makes a lot of difference when you're when you're honoured within the industry, isn't it? Because there's one oh. thing honoured by your clients, but within your peer group, it it means a lot, doesn't it? It really does. Yeah. And it's something that I think with awards, it's quite a tricky one sometimes because, um, you know, you kind of have to understand how it works. I mean, you know, back in the day, I was, you know, we were running campaigns at this tech startup and we were like, why are we not getting any awards? It's like, you have to, you have to put yourself forward for it. You have to believe in yourself Mm. and believe that your work is award winning in order to even be in the running. You know, you have to kind of push yourself forward and take that step. So um, it was something that I really wanted to achieve with Pepper because I feel like it just hadn't really been even a consideration before. Um, And also it just felt like, you know that reassurance from the industry I mean the judges within these awards are the experts and the leaders within the respective industries so um to have that kind of recognition amongst them and also you know we when Pepper first started it was just myself Joe and Alice it was literally just the three of us building this whole company and we were up against some really massive agencies with a lot of resource and so to be celebrated within that kind of peer group um, very humbling, but also made, made me feel so proud of the work that we're doing. And it, it gives you that reassurance that, you know, we're doing something that is needed for the industry and um, is worth celebrating. So, yeah, it's been um, it's been something that we're, we're really proud of. And so did you ever feel I mean, obviously, you said a moment ago, it's a bit turbulent at times. What, what are some of the lessons that you have learned over that period? You know, and if you were 
to look at yourself now in the mirror, not knowing what you know now, three, three or four years on, what would you be saying to yourself as an entrepreneur? So, I mean, th this is the thing is when you start your company after immediately losing your job to a company that's like got liquidated, there are so many lessons from seeing a company that has employees, has staff, has results, had funding fail that it's like, okay, so cash flow is the most important thing in the world never ever spend more money than you have um <laughs> you know it, it's very simple things you would think but then I guess when scale is involved it just kind of some things go out of the window but we, it made us very very conservative in how we run the business and then also it doesn't matter how much goodwill that you build up with influencers it doesn't matter the rapport that you have with them it doesn't matter how great the content is or that concept of whatever how many times you're a repeat customer if you are late paying the influencers it's all out of the window because it's just not acceptable you have to really be very strict with that stick to the terms that are agreed to um the amount of influencers who do get messed around by brands, by agencies who, you know, they do work, they don't ever get paid for it, or it's months and months down the line and chasing and chasing late fees, all, all the rest of it. Um, it, it, it's, it looks bad on, it looks bad on the brand at the end of the day, because it looks bad on the industry as well. Yeah, if, it if does. You, if you were considering investing in the sector and you have a poor performing campaign or, or a poor relationship, um, no, I'm absolutely with you, 100. percent I mean, I, 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 I mean, I've, I've worked in the, in the brand space for years, and it used to shock me that sometimes they'd be paying 90 days, and and you know, the, we, these are and even small businesses, it's just unacceptable. It really, really is, and it, and and you can understand why now some influencers are saying like they want money up front, you know, yeah. or I want at least 50 percent up front or something like that. But um, no, interesting points that you raise there. Um, and what about sort of scaling? Because that, again, for a small agency can be sometimes a, 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 a challenge because you can see lots of opportunity um, potentially coming on board and clients coming back to you. But what, what, what what's your thoughts around that? So we only built out our team at Pepper this year. So um, we started hiring in the beginning of the year um, and our team has grown significantly since then. Um, and it's something that we, you know, we took a long time to get to the point where we were like, okay, it's time. We're ready to take this next step. And then also to do it steadily as we continue to grow. It's that steady growth. I think there's so much pressure and, you know, it's for various reasons. I understand it um, to grow really quickly um, and expand really quickly. But ultimately, how can your culture keep up with that? How can your processes keep up with that? It's it's a difficult one to kind of balance. Um, and so, you know, you, you can understand why there would be issues associated with it. But I think for us, it's kind of still having that slightly conservative mindset just in terms of it's it's not a uh, it's what is it, a race, not a sprint. Um, let's exactly. go at, at a pace that's, you know, uh, works well for us. And it's been working all right for us so far. Yeah, that's great. I mean, although, you know, campaigns and, and how you create them and the partnerships and all that sort of thing is super important. Getting the right people in your agency is absolutely critical, isn't it? You know, so we're still a people business. So what are the types of uh, attributes you look for when you're hiring people? Well, this is one of the, it's really great that you say that, to be honest, because this is the core ethos of Pepper is we have this thing called the human approach. And this is from three people who worked at an influencer tech startup saying, this isn't what our business is going to be about. Ultimately, the reason why influencer marketing works so well is because of that trust that's built between the influencer and their audience. And why shouldn't that trust be carried through to the brand relationship, through the agency relationship? Um, and we can be the ones to broker that. So for us, it's all about having those conversations, doing that due diligence, seeing them as people. Because I mean, some of these like apps and, and by the way I don't mean to be disparaging there is a time and a place and you know good case reasons to utilize everything that everybody's offering in the influencer space and I, I want to see it continue to grow but then when on the other side I'm an influencer I'm doing a campaign with a brand through an app I don't even know the name of the person who I'm negotiating with I don't have the chance to negotiate because it's a set price I can't say oh by the way here's two options which one do you like best because it's you can only upload one image and here's the finalized caption there's no room for that creative collaboration and by the end of it it's just you know it feels so impersonal and programmatic when I was a person on the other end of the the campaign with ideas you know I wanted to make it it worked better but it just felt a little bit 
uh, cold to me. So yeah, I, I, I get that, and I couldn't agree with you more. To be honest, and and I I don't like some parts of programmatic advertising. It it just feels very much like that. It's why we switch off a lot of banner ads, but we engage in influencer ads because they've got that human authentic touch about them. Um, we can relate to them in a way that perhaps traditional advertising can't. And particularly amongst uh, Gen Zs, they, they are real turned off by some traditional advertising. And they, they see it as an invasion. But actually, when... Um, when their content creator comes on 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 stream um, and a brand is almost branded content, it seems that it's integral in the content. Do you agree? It feels like it's, yeah. it's, it's meant to be. And suddenly that brand looks super cool. Absolutely. And that's the thing is this is this however you want to call it parasocial whatever it's the close relationship the influencer has with their audience that yes they know the influencer is being paid they ha they trust the influencer to choose brands that they think that their audience will like the brands that they resonate with themselves brands that they would use themselves and so it's it's you know it's, it's mutually beneficial for the audience they get to listen to an advert that is perfectly tailored and attuned to them and also they get the satisfaction of knowing i'm supporting my favorite content creator through doing this you know because i like them they give me so much free content and entertainment this is the least that i can do to give back to them so Oh, and that's why it's pl platforms like Twitch have been hugely successful, haven't they? Because, you know, people are, are donating um, to their favorite content creator for, 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 for the points that you just raised and entertainment value um, more than anything else. Um, so, yeah, it's really good to see that you've uh, succeeded. And, and I know that you've um, you got into the Forbes under 30 list as well. And, and what was all that about? How did how did you get into that? Oh, my goodness. I mean, that was <laughs> that was such a. Like that was a really crazy morning when I woke up because they don't tell you before you, you make the list. So I just woke up and I saw my emails with like blurry eyes and I was like, am I reading this right? And it was just the most, yeah, unbelievable day. I mean, I, I it was a bit of a pipe dream. I was like, well, you know, I'll shoot, shoot for the immediate. And then also like there's this big stuff that might never, ever happen. But I think it was... Um, a couple years ago now so I was like oh I've got a couple years left in my 20s before you know the 30 ends and <laughs> then it's Forbes 30 over 30 surely um but yeah it was just it was it was again it was one of those things which is really um so validating I suppose to be recognized by like such an institution as Forbes and then also um you know recognized by the industry with with the influencer marketing awards that we've participated in um I think that we touched on that a little bit earlier that imposter syndrome type thing yeah. um, and I'm sure that everybody falls victim to that at some some points but you know being amongst this kind of really incredible groups um hopefully kind of combats away some of that that feeling and um yeah it really kind of provides a great foundation to go from yeah no it's great I mean you talk about imposter do you think um there are um a lot of creators out there that work on their own and feel like they're, you know, are they worthy enough? Is their content good enough for this brand? You know, they, um, they, they've they suddenly got loads of followers and brands are now starting to reach out to them or, or you are. Do you think they have lots of self-doubt issues um, and challenges at times that where I think an agency approach that helps support them more than just the campaign but a shoulder to cry on and uh, I mean I'm not suggesting you're a talent agency but I'm just saying there is when you've got a good relationship with people they don't you know stuff doesn't always go the way you want it to go it's true it's true to be honest with you and the ethos that I try and stick by is if the influencer's content isn't coming through as you know the brand wants it or as we want it um, having we are the ones who chose that influencer we reached out to them we know what their content is like the failing is on us if we didn't communicate correctly what we were looking for mm. um, and things can be combated I mean sometimes it's a case of even just picking up the phone and having a chat with the influencer or let's have like a pre-shooting kickoff call just to make sure that there's that forum for answering any questions that they might have or or you're just making sure everything's clearly understood but ultimately you know if the, if the content's coming through and it's not quite right that's that's on us. So we need to do better to support them, give them all the information they need, all the tools they need, um, and and give them a brief that's within their wheelhouse. If we're asking somebody who's like a, a vlogger to create a really like polished, like, you know, you know, HD 4K kind of cinematic piece, we're probably looking in the wrong <laughs> direction. Okay. Wow. Um, so, you know, it's, we've got to work with the influencer and, and then that should really mitigate most of that kind of issue. 
So I think, as I said, uh, the, the purpose of this podcast was, was as much about your own experience. And I think from what you're saying here, it sounds like you, because you understand what's required and what it was like for you, this experience has, has played uh, has played very well to you because the influences that you are talking to relate to you as one of them. Uh, and therefore, you know, you only have um, reasons to succeed in a way. Um, but are, have there been things that have gone wrong? Um, and I mean, you just said it's on us, but have there been other things? That, and how do we address that? Oh, yeah, of course, there's always things that go, that go wrong. I mean, you know, key messages is, is one thing, you know, we've had to learn, we've got to be very, very prescriptive, not just with what we want to hear, but also actually what we don't want to hear, because sometimes they can come through incredibly wrong and against what the brand would be looking for. And so, you know, there's always learnings to be made. Um, but, you know, on the flip side, I remember how... <laughs> confused I was sometimes by reading a brief from a brand and I was like I I don't get this like this is so confusing yeah. um and so just from from our side it, it's like if we can take that step back I mean what's that thing people always say it's like could you explain this to your grandmother it's like that's how a brief should be you shouldn't need all of this extra context that we've had from the privilege of you know pitching and negotiating with the brand and all of this kind of thing um we shouldn't need all of that context for the roof to be understandable it should be you know anyone picks it up they're like i know exactly what i should be going for so that's kind of the goal that we have i love that and i think the simplicity of it just and and and, and you know and even kickoff meetings are super important you know i often say is it is it nike or is it nike and right. be, and so if you're doing a piece of video content and you are saying the words in the wrong way, you'll have done all of that work, gone to a shoot, and nobody has thought to even think about the pronunciation of the way that brand is is put together. And this is the thing as well, is because, I mean, especially in the early days, if content would come through and the brand will say, you know, oh, could you could you just change this word? And it's like, it's a, it's a 10 minute YouTube video where I'm sitting down talking to the camera. I can't just change the word. I can either cut it out or I have to re-record the entire video. And even just having that level of understanding is, it, it, you know, is, is crazy. So yeah, there really has to be that level of empathy of like, did we give them everything that we could to be respectful of the influencer's time um, ultimately and, and the effort that it takes and the energy that it takes to, you know, put together um, a video which which they're, they're proud of, they've submitted to us and then, you know, small pedantic things like that that could have been sorted out in the beginning actually cause problems further down the line. Yeah, no, great. I mean, so what, you know, looking forward to the future, what, what's, um, what's your future landscape look like? It's quite an interesting time on social media at the moment, isn't it? I mean, is Twitter going to be around by the time this podcast is posted? Uh, <laughs> not sure. <laughs> um, I, but ultimately, uh, then on the other hand, I'm seeing um, other you know competitors starting to emerge um, because people are feeling uncomfortable with the landscape of how that social platform has developed. Similarly, TikTok is such a huge behemoth and we're seeing, um, you know, other apps follow suit, Instagram, Reels, YouTube Shorts. They're seeing the success of short form video, which, to be honest, they could have seen, you know, when Vine was around, but nobody took the initiative until TikTok delivered it in such a way that was so successful. So um, it's interesting keeping up. Apps like Be Real fascinate me. This idea of the way that we consume and interact with um, social media is going to change and it might become a bit more mindful. I mean, at the moment, certainly it feels like social media is very much based on addiction models um, in terms of how we interact with it, how we engage with it. And I think that young people especially are bearing the brunt of this. And so it's, you know, there's things like screen time, app timeouts. Ultimately, you're, you're, though, you're up against a system which which isn't designed to keep you off it, it's designed to keep you on it. And so how does this more mindful approach, I think that we're going to be experiencing in the future, how will that feed more into um, into where we see social platform sitting, influencer culture sitting, um, digital culture in general? Great. Oh, it's lovely. It's really fantastic to hear your enthusiasm and energy for your brand and the industry at large. Uh, Becky Flint, it's been a pleasure talking to you today. Thank you so much. Likewise. That's it for another edition of Influence. Don't forget to subscribe to the show and give me your feedback, gordon at gordonglenitor.com, or you can follow me on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, where you can also ask me a question. If you're able to give us a five-star review, we really do appreciate it.
And also, if you want help in creating an influencer marketing strategy or you want to join our the um, Influencer Marketing Roundtable event, which we host every Wednesday morning on Zoom, then head over to gordonglenister.com where you can find out more about the details. And if you want to find out more about our shows and many others, go over to the MPN, the Marketing Podcast Network, and you can find them all there. Thanks, as always, to my producer, Neil Whiteside from Freedom One. And until next time, from me, Gordon Venister, it's bye for now.